Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here. So today's episode of the podcast is a little bit different. So back in December, we had the Thriving Farmer Summit, and one of the presenters was Brian Bates. Now, Brian has done a previous episode on the podcast, and it was so popular, we had him for the summit, and his talk in the summit generated so much um conversation and just people talking about it, I wanted to actually air that talk here on the podcast as an episode. So in this um, episode, you're going to learn from Brian about how Brian has intentionally narrowed the focus on his farm to explode his profitability, give him the space to tweak his systems. You're also going to hear Brian's view on seasonal part-time labor versus year-round full-time employees, or as you know, I, my friend Jordan Green calls them, pro-employees. You're going to talk to him, hear him talk about how Brian views his team and their role on his farm and why they have no job descriptions, as well as you will hear from Brian talk all about how he's working to make the summer months easier for their team so they can enjoy recreational activities more and stack some of their work more toward the winter on their farm. So it's a very interesting take on how he's built out his team, how he's built out his farm systems, and just what Brian is doing to make his farm very profitable in a very small town setting. So a lot of people like to talk about how Brian's got a a great market and Brian doesn't necessarily have a great market. Brian has a great marketing system, which allows him to sell much with much more market penetration than many other farms do in much more populated areas. So um, enjoy the episode and definitely looking forward to feedback and what you thought. Hey, Thriving Farmers. So joining me today is Brian Bates from Bear Creek Organic Farm. And Brian, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So Brian, I wanted to have you talk today about the team that you've built at Bear Creek Organic Farm. But first, give people a little bit of background about your your start in the farming um, world. Yeah. Well, I'll keep that brief because there's never really like a super short story to starting a farm. But um it's it's quite simple really i was in college my then girlfriend now wife and i wanted to help save the world and do our small piece to do so we saw some opportunities in food and farming to feel good on the day-to-day but also be tackling like macro problems so that felt good yeah just two wide-eyed kids trying to save the world and we ended up in northern michigan primarily because of climate change we were trying to preempt all the changes in seasonality and climate that we knew to be coming to the south of us i'm from virginia originally my wife's from indiana and we both knew you know in the course of our life those places would become much less comfortable to inhabit never mind trying to grow things so we tried to move as far north as we could before we got to canada uh which we did a pretty good job (laughs) and uh and we're smack dab in the center of the largest freshwater body in the world. And so we knew water before even climate would become the biggest issue, water resource would become a big issue. So we have pretty cheap land around here is like to between two and 4,000 an acre, depending on if it's wooded or unwooded. Um, no major markets around us. So there's not a lot of competition for land. There's not a ton of development pressure. Uh, our town is 6,000 people. Our county is 30,000 people. One whole side of our delivery radius is Lake Michigan, so we have a lot less delivery radius to work with. Um, and we're in Petoskey, Michigan. I should have said that. We're in Petoskey, Michigan, which is a pretty popular summer like resort sort of tourist destination. So it would be akin to um, you know some of the like San Juan Islands in, in Washington State or Cape Cod or like you know down east Maine. Like it's it's got not maybe the same amount of money that some of the New England places have, but the summer population is generally more affluent than the winter population. Um, but that being said, um, majority of our business is with year-round residents. And that people try all the time to dismiss us and say that we benefit from the um, seasonal people. And it, that our sales just demonstrate that's simply not the case. And number one reason I know that's not the case is an incredibly small part of our business is restaurants. And that's where a lot of the big money goes. So um, our team, so we're finishing, wrapping up year six on our farm. 
Um, wrapping up year six, we've grown oddly with no real specific goal, almost exactly $100,000 a year each year. So first year was 26,000, then it was 125, then it was 210, then 310, then 410, and this year will be at like 515. So it's just been very consistent that way. Um, no real conscious goal to shoot for 100 grand, but that just seems to be where we keep landing. So because that's worked for six years, guess what? 2020's goal, 600 grand, right? Like, why would we change it? So, um, so yeah. So how those sales split up? Yeah. Uh, crop groups. You said by crop? Crop group, I guess, if you want to, yeah. Oh, good, yeah. So probably... I would say plants. So we do like a lot of plants from the greenhouse. So plants in general is probably 25% maybe. Wow. And then microgreens is probably 20 to 25%. And then tomatoes is like 15%. And salad mix is like 15%. And then everything else is kind of the, 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 the balance. Uh, garlic's like 10 and um no garlic's not even 10 what am i saying garlic's like probably five five percent okay it's weird right because as the gross number has gotten bigger i gotta readjust what my mental you know it's a lot easier to grow more plants or more microgreens or more lettuce in a given year mm -hmm. um it's much harder to all of a sudden double garlic sales yeah yeah so absolutely. So that's really interesting that how that's all split up. It's all those quick turn crops that are really making you the money. And also obviously it's what the, what the clientele wants. Yeah. And we're in a really cold area. So that there's another theme here is that like almost all that's coming from protected culture. So I would say of our total gross sales, at least 75% is from inside a hoop house or a greenhouse. So that's pretty significant to keep in mind. And the other big difference, the breakdown I usually offer up so people can understand since we're, we're specifically not a CSA farm is we're about 50% farmers markets, about 35, 40% direct to consumer, both at farmers market. I'm sorry, did I say 40, 50% farmers markets? I meant grocery stores. Okay. 40, 50, yeah. Grocery stores. yeah, I'm sorry. So we're 50% to grocery stores and then the 50% grocery stores, 30 to 40 is direct. That's at farmer's market. We do a plant sale on the farm and then we do some online sales. That's the 30 to 40. And then 10%, if even that, with restaurants. Yeah. They're just such a small portion of what we do and they're really a pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. So uh, you are in the process of a big expansion. Yeah, almost Two done. Two weeks almost to go. Two weeks to go. So tell us, what did that involve? Yeah, uh, half a million dollars. Okay. And all of my free time. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, we added two more greenhouses, two more hoop houses, tripled the size of our washing and packing area, and some overall imp infrastructure improvements, like doing the electric the right way, putting in a propane main line, just doing some buried stuff that'll make everybody's life easier. Yeah, it's been great. We're almost done. We're just finishing doing the benches inside the last, inside the big, the new big greenhouse. And the distinction we drew with folks, because a lot of our customers asked about it, like this expansion did nothing to add new products. It's just to increase our capacity of our existing product mix. And that's been a narrative we've been trying to push with folks is we're not, we're not like, oh, we've got all these hoop houses. Now we've got, you know, coconuts and hot peppers. No, no. It's just... Uh, more tomatoes, more, more shoulder season greens, more ability to continue rotating how we'd like to keep rotating, and more, more space for plants and microgreens. So we're just, we just picked all our winning enterprises, and I'm a big believer in just fueling the flames. So um, we're fueling the fire, fanning the flames. So everything that's working, we're just doubling down on that. So to grow to that size, to the farm you are now, you've had to build a, a rock solid team to be yeah. able to manage that, especially because you've been so focused on the expansion. Talk to us about your team. Yeah, well, our team's great. I mean, like, obviously I'm going to say that. That's why I'm here. But the important backstory to our team is, like, Ann and I had worked and volunteered on some farms that did not have great teams. 
And so our, all of our initial business plans included us never having employees. Mm. Uh, just because we thought, man, like it just must be the way it is working on farm sucks. And so we're not going to put somebody else through that. So we'll just build every business to never have employees. Mm -hmm. And that's why our initial business plan, the ones that we got loans for and everything was about garlic greens and honey with the idea that garlic and honey have these sort of peak periods and then greens would fill the middle. And that's all we, we it was just going to be the two of us. And after five years, we'd quit our, one of us would quit our job. And after 10 years, the other one would quit our job. And we'd have this nice tidy business doing like 150 grand a year. And that, I mean, it's laughable now, but to be frank, like what two, two dominant things changed. We grossly underestimated the demand for our product. Mm -hmm. And I think we were being conservative to avoid failure for sure. Right. Like you don't, yeah. Like, Knows that your expectation is too high, easier to be satisfied. So I think we were trying to, um, you know, a little bit not risk averse, but failure averse. And the other thing that changed is some great people came into our life. Mm -hmm. And so we end up in this position where we want to like grow the farm, but all of a sudden we see more opportunity because we have like these great people and these great people love us and, and we love them and they live here and we live here and, it's just they're they're not like trying to ditch us to start their own farm but they're also i don't know just just kind of this nice combination of factors mm -hmm. and that's the sort of i don't want to say it's the secret sauce but that's the part that's not replicable just this this way i just believe you got to put out good put out good juju and sometimes it, it'll circle back for you and if mm -hmm. these people didn't come into our life i do think other people would have you know just yeah. the way yeah. things have gone with benefit of hindsight yeah. So yeah. it started with these two individuals who both started working for us in part-time capacities, both because of volunteering arrangements that we had with other people who put us in touch with these people who they were like, you know, it's been nice, but like, you might even really like this person more and they might like it more. And so yeah. they're literally in the other room right now. And some of them who are entering our fourth year with them. So talk to us about that aspect of obviously those people kind of came Yep. So, but you obviously had to build something that they wanted to come to as well. I mean, you had to have that mission orientation because they're not just showing up for a paycheck. No, no. In fact, they're really not. Uh, that's been like a weird part about this whole dynamic for me. It's like offering them more money has not really changed anything. Sometimes it feels like when you're negotiating, that's like your only leverage, but it really has, it really has no value. And so my whole thing is just be a human. Mm -hmm. like be a human and I've said that before and I'll say it again but like just be a human so like these people are not just our workers they're not our help they're not our crew they're not our harvesters they're other humans that we're working alongside with to achieve our goal mm -hmm. so we do have a mission and it's it's very crystal clear that we're trying to build something good build something sustainable both in a financial sense and in an environmental sense and with a strong community focus so 85 percent of our sales are within 12 miles of our farm that's been sort of a sales end of things. All of our labor comes from the two counties that our farm is kind of on the border of two counties. So we're also not like bringing people in from far away. I think being part of that fabric of the community matters from sales and from labor, mm -hmm. but you got to treat them how you want to be treated. I've worked on farms and treated like shit. I was never going to do that. The other thing you have to understand is for two years, Ann and I built this farm with just the two of us. Half the time we were living in a camper, then we were living in a pole barn. But like, there's not a task on our farm that somebody's doing that I haven't already done. Mm -hmm. So there's no like, well, I'm going to stay in my office and keep doing this. I didn't even have an office. I was, out, I was out doing everything. And so I think working alongside people makes a really, really big difference. And also making sure that they get to see many different aspects of the operation. So like, it wasn't like, oh, good, you're here. Today we'll weed because you're here. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, great. You're here. Well, today this is what we're going to do because this is what we need to do. Mm -hmm. and we're going to do it together. Mm -hmm. And so that's been pretty, that's been pretty significant. So one of the things you mentioned to me is you do not have job descriptions. Talk to us a little bit about that. <sighs> well, we don't have job descriptions because we've never actually hired for a job. We've never actually posted a job. So when you make a job description, it's because you need to hire somebody to fill a job and everybody who works for us currently came here in through some kind of informal means, either a 30 hour internship through the community college or some reference from their sister. I mean, it's just been word of mouth to the max. Yeah. So that never necessitated a job description upfront. But the other thing is, uh, 
it's just kind of been like me and my merry band of helpers <laughs> tackling every day. Like we don't have, we don't have like, uh, like defined, we don't have like department managers. There's not like, uh, you know, people have their strengths and we tend to, you know, on a daily basis gravitate towards those. Yeah. But you know, if I, if everybody comes in one day and, and I'm like, look today we are all digging trenches because we got to bury this electrical wire while the ground is soft. Like that happened last week no one's job description is expert trench digger nobody's yeah. probably even dug a trench before but like that's what needed to happen and we're all gonna go do it and you obviously can't do that with everything but it's definitely just been me working with them we're thinking next year of potentially creating uh like accountabilities okay we've learned over the years just being part of like different strategic planning things and we're on boards of other organizations that like an individual can usually handle three to five like core responsibilities. Yeah. And so we are thinking about next year trying to figure out what are the core responsibilities and then having some redundancy. What mm -hmm. we've seen where we've run into issues is with a great team, but a small team is let's say like two people are sick. We could be SOL. And so that's, that's not great. And that's been a pinch. That's been a painful spot. Mm -hmm. uh, this spring, those two people I talked about who've been with us for four years, they both had babies. One's wife, the other, our actual employee, had babies four days apart. Those are, at the time, my only two full-time workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that's, now, there's some like yeah with injustice in that for me as an employer but there's also just this element of it's hard to plan for that and it is quite challenging to plan for that but we just started to see the value in making sure people were cross-trained and, yeah. and so our thinking next year is that there'll be some accountabilities that people are responsible for and for everyone that somebody's a lead on there's a secondary or there's a protege or some somebody else who can help handle that yeah um so yeah no job descriptions to date and we do check-ins usually twice a year usually midsummer and just to touch base see how everybody's doing and end of the year we'll do check-ins today and every time i ask them if they feel like they'd have a better time if they had a job description and nobody's ever said they wish they had one so mm -hmm. i think that's a good thing yeah okay so one of the things that you did this year with your team the ones that had babies you gave them paid time off talk to us a little bit about that because that's that's that took you knowing your numbers be able to know that you could afford that yeah, but even if we can't, you got to be a human first. Yeah. I mean, look, like, I think that's one of the greatest shortcomings in this country is that we do not offer, we don't, forget incentivizing, we don't even accommodate people who have babies. And so we had our first baby last summer, and they all stepped up, and I kept taking a paycheck. I get, I'm on payroll with everybody else every week. I get a paycheck. And... I thought like, it's not only is it an incredibly stressful time, it's an incredibly expensive time. It's the worst possible time to take away somebody's income stream. The good thing is with a baby, for me or for my employees, is you get a nine month heads up. Yes. So we started, <laughs> we, started, uh, we started saving for when yeah. they go on, on leave. We started saving and then we reached out to some of our uh, words of mouth people and we found somebody else to come work full-time while they were gone and then our other two people who were working like three-quarter time agreed to work full-time during that period as well and so everybody stepped in mm. and so we offered 50 percent pay so they they make like 20 dollars an hour so they were getting 10 dollars an hour or yeah 20 dollars an hour for 20 hours a week right so they were getting a 50 percent paycheck every week for for amber i mean for our our female employees who was giving birth up to three months and then for our um uh male employees up to a month and a half and mm -hmm. so six weeks so we thought that was thought that was fair yeah so another thing i want to bring up is the concept of let's say a pro employee versus like seasonal help or like you know intern that kind of thing talk to us your because some people would say i just want new people every year because like they're cheap but your thing is, I want to build a team long-term, full-time, that will be here and can do everything very well. So I'm a huge believer in all aspects of life, that you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've worked alongside people that get paid a lot and get paid a little, but like you get what you pay for. And so there's me plus four other workers who are full-time year-round. Mm. 
that's the case this year, that'll be the case in 2020. Our plan, after we saw how that went this year, we had three seasonal apprentices this year. Mm -hmm. Our plan next year is to make that five, but still with the idea of three seasonal apprentices, and we'd love to find two other people that are like full-time but seasonal. Gotcha. Our farm runs the whole year, but we're busiest from April to the end of September. Mm -hmm. And when you're stuck just getting interns on an academic calendar, either collegiate academic or high school academic, they never start early enough in the spring for mm -hmm. when we need help. And they always leave too early in the, in the summer for when we still have a lot to do. So we put disproportionate value on having enough people in those shoulder seasons because that can really make or break the busy season. So our plan next year is to have the five of us and then to have five other people that are part-time part of the year full-time does that make sense so yeah. they're, like, they're basically working a thousand hours of the year instead of a two thousand hour work year and they would make anywhere between uh 10 to 14 an hour it, it's a spread we're open to negotiation if somebody can stay for the shoulder seasons they will get they will get more money because that provides more value to us mm -hmm. gotcha. but for our for our year-round workers the average pay i think is like 17 or 18 dollars an hour some of us and some of us make 20 to 21 and the low end is like 15 gotcha so you know when you're going out to hire these new people that are going to be for next year how are you doing that i mean what's that process look like uh so we've just like always got feelers out mm -hmm. the people that are like other good humans that want to join our merry band of vegetable growers um and for the apprenticeship thing, for the summer, the summer sort of formalized apprenticeship, we did, that was the first job description we made just for that short, just to really help manage expectations. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's an apprenticeship just like what I did, except I was getting either unpaid or 250 bucks a week. We pay them $10 an hour. And then if they complete the apprenticeship, they get a thousand dollar bonus um, for staying, staying through to the end. And we posted that at a couple of farm conferences and maybe sent it out to like the Michigan State Organic Farming Program, but, but that was it. And then there is a community college here. So yeah, community college, yeah. Michigan State Organic Farming Program, and um, one farming conference. And we got a bunch of applicants. What we don't have is housing, and we're in a summer spot. So housing is always a bottleneck. So we had a couple of people that were great, but they couldn't secure housing. And so say la vie, right? That's just, that's just the way it goes. Yeah. So then when you interviewed them, did you have them come to like a working trial on the farm to see how that fit, how they gelled? Yeah, so if proximity was an issue, we just did a phone interview. Mm -hmm. I, I really tried to drill in hard on what they have done. I've started to realize that all farms are not created equal. Mm -hmm. And so just because they've worked on a farm and list a bunch of things that they did, for us, sometimes that's more baggage than it is benefit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you work on a really... Uh, poorly operated farm that doesn't necessarily help me a whole lot you know Thanks. give me somebody who's aggressive and hungry who's never worked on a farm and I'll tell them what they need to know yeah uh, I'm not from a farming family none of our workers are from farming backgrounds exactly zero of us worked on a farm before they worked here include you know so so I, I'm not I'm really looking for a good human and not not a good not a good farmer and then if it's in person I absolutely show them around Mm -hmm. And I try not to sugarcoat it. And I try, I hope that some of our, the rest of our crew is here so they can just like meet them and get some vibes. But I mean, like company culture comes up a lot for like big corporations. We have a culture just because of the way that we are, but it's pretty laid back. It's pretty sort of like, there's a lot of banter. There's a lot of like joking and nobody tries to take themselves too seriously. And so if somebody is like, perfectly great but not able to like yeah just it out and receive it like that is sometimes a little bit of like an incongruity and so we have run into that over the years where somebody is working with us or just volunteering or you know like i said there's this 30 hour internship program through the community college and we get a bunch of people you know two in the fall two in the spring each mm -hmm. semester and some of them don't really jive with our banter your and job I, band of 
vegetable growers. That's right, exactly. <laughs> and, and and jolly we are, right? Like you got to be able yeah. to come up with good puns and whatever. So so that's that's the gig. And so we've also noticed though that sometimes those people bring down the overall mood not because they're trying to, it's just the way that they are. Yeah. So I feel some obligation as sort of the captain of the ship to uh, find somebody who's going to fit because I want them to be comfortable, but also to make sure they're not going to dramatically change the environment so that the rest of the crew feels like they're holding back because so-and-so is in the room or whatever. There's no perfect situation, but like I'm a decent read of people. I'm pretty comfortable talking to a lot of different people. And whereas it used to just be me asking myself, could I work with this person every day? Mm. Now it's me asking, can all of us work with this person every day? You know, I have to answer to everybody about that. And so um, that, that usually makes a big difference. But no, it's not a working interview. We don't have that kind of, we don't have that kind of time. Like, I don't feel right asking that much of them for a $10 an hour job. Right, that's like the lowest lowest on the totem pole. If we were to be hiring somebody to replace one of our core people now, if one of them decides to move yeah. on, then then we would want we would want them to work with us for a couple of days, just to just to see if they know what they say they know, and really to see if they jive with the group. That chemistry is really special, and it's something that we try really hard to maintain. If you've been enjoying this episode so far, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer. It includes resources such as our 10 winter growing secrets we wish we knew when we started, which is a ebook which talks about the tips and techniques to get better growth in your winter production. We teach things like the simple but counterintuitive principle that trips up most beginning growers, the shape and size of tunnels that are best for winter production, how to prepare beds so they are weed free and get beautiful lush stands of crops, what to do about pests like aphids, voles, and slugs, how to fast track your research to fine tune your production for your microclimate, and how to pack in more crops for higher yields and profits. So head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. Yeah. So let's talk about the hard times. I mean, farming is not always fun and games. How yeah. do you keep that motivation going when it's 20 degrees outside and you've got to do things outside and it's cold and wet? So I don't like to be uncomfortable. So I try to avoid that at all costs. Mm -hmm. And I have started to hear them over there in the other room talk about how they know I'll avoid it. And so they don't have to worry about it. So, so I might have, to, might have to change that this winter and show them, you know, what's what. But... Um, you know, I don't like being comfortable. I like how many greenhouses and hoop houses we have. And I try really hard to be civil about what's expected. You know, we do not have rain gear. Okay. Because if it's raining, we're going to look for other things to do. I mean, that's just, okay. There's, there's exactly one pair of rain bands on the farm and they're not fully waterproof. So if it's, if it's raining, we're going to wait till it stops or we'll do it tomorrow. I mean, we always get it all done. You know, I'm yeah. not here to just like crack the whip. That doesn't seem right. So, so that's, that's one element. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty consistent on that. So there's, I can't think of a time when it's been 20 degrees and we've been all outside. I really can't, but the harder times come in different ways. The harder times for us tend to come with people feel like they're, they're working too much in the summer. Mm -hmm. which a lot of times is up here and it's not, you know, maybe is maybe the hour sheets don't really show that, but if that's how you're feeling, then I, as a manager, I need to acknowledge that that's how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. I get frustrated sometimes and I go look at the hour sheets and I'm like, this is bullshit. Like they're working 42 hours. I'm working 72 hours. And like, <laughs> they're the ones that are tired. Like, come on. But yeah. I got to remember if that's how they're feeling, that's how they're going to perform. Mm. And if that's how they're going to perform, that's not, I don't want that. I don't want them to resent being here. I don't want them to be bringing down the overall vibe of the team. I don't want them to be performing their tasks sloppily. Mm -hmm. So there's some times where I've, I'm like, if they're checked out, I'm like, just go home. Yeah. Go, it doesn't happen a lot, right? Like I can list it on one hand the number of times it's happened, but it's like, seriously, just go home. Like you're, you're, you're not helping. I'm not helping by making you stay here. Like, yeah, just 
sleep it off, come back tomorrow. So, so that's, that's, we tend to get that like sort of summer burnout. It's super exacerbated here too, because like summer's a really fun time here. And so a lot of people are like doing a lot of fun things and like everyone else is on vacation. So like, yeah, you go to work, you see people, you know, like kite surfing and like skydiving. Like there's just like a lot yeah. of cool hyper summer things going on. So it, there is a bit of that sort of FOMO vibe. Mm -hmm. And so we try to recognize that. Um, so that would be a hard time. The other hard time is winter for me, for us. You mm -hmm. know, we, we in 2020 will be dividing the year into trimesters because we've noticed over the course of the years, there's a pretty long stretch, uh, a third of the year, as it turns out, where our payroll cost alone is higher than our gross revenue per week on a weekly basis. Okay. So let's say we, you know, January, we do like $2,500 in some week and our payroll cost will be $3,200. Mm -hmm. that doesn't account for keeping the lights on overhead insurance payment like like all the other things like forget all that just for straight labor to sales we're, we're out of formula right okay that's hard mm -hmm. that requires some challenging finagling of numbers yeah but in the summer trimester there are some weeks where labor to sales is 10 percent yeah Payroll, you know, payroll might be, maybe it's, maybe it's 15%, but there are some weeks where we do 30, 35, $40,000 and yeah. payroll is maybe only like five grand. Yeah. And so the challenge as an operator is to, you know, not get lost in the forest, but to sort of step back and say, okay, in these slower times, what are all the things we can do to add value to these busier times? to make the quality of life in the busier times better, but also to just, to just do it. Mm -hmm. Like, so we're really going to be focused this winter on what are all the things we can do in the winter? Not like cleaning something for the third time, but I'm saying like, what are the things that we do? And we're, we're all challenging ourselves with this question. Yeah. What are yeah. the things that we do when we're really busy that it doesn't matter when we do it? Mm. I'll give you an example. I'll give you two examples. We hang our tomatoes, we tie our tomatoes with twine in the hoop house. We, you know, put the weed mat down, put the drip tape down, plant the tomatoes, put the fertilizer down, and then we go through and tie the twine on the top and then tie it to the bottom. And next year, I think we're going to use some hooks. Doesn't matter. The point is, there's twine involved, and up until now, we've been cutting the twine. So we usually set up two stakes outside the hoop house and take the ball of twine and make the length and then snip them and then climb up and tie them up. Well, when we knew two workers were going to be having babies, right, when we'd be planting tomatoes, we thought, what are the things we could do? And we're like, why are we cutting twine in summer? Mm -hmm. I mean, the inventory investment on three hoop houses worth of twine is exactly $28. <laughs> okay. The labor investment is much higher than that. Yeah. And our hands, frankly, it's more comfortable just do it inside in the winter. Mm -hmm. so we made each hoop house's worth of twine, put a bundle for each row, set eight rows in each hoop house, set all those bundles away. Time came, it was all ready to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one thing where the, the, the completion of that task is completely time irrelevant. Yeah. The second thing in the biggest labor sink is harvest mornings. We do a lot with retail, a lot with retail. So like we're packing hundreds, thousands of clamshells a week, clamshells, bags, whatever. Everything has a sticker. For years, we've been stickering those the morning up. Times when two people would go harvest and two people would stay inside the sticker. Yeah. What if, wait for it, four people go harvest because all that crap is already stickered. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we've got a busy December. We've got conferences, holiday party. We've got a lot of things going on that are fun and whatever for the crew. So this afternoon, we got a big flat screen in the, work, in the wash back. We're going to turn on some Christmas movies and we're just going to all sit there and sticker and have a good time. Nice. Because, because like it's raining outside. So we don't want to do, we got outside things. We don't want to do them. Yep. And we got a busy December and we got the rest of the week off. So what better thing to do than to have a good time, turn an otherwise mundane task into an enjoyable task. And yeah. by the way, save all of that energy and time for when we really need it to harvest. Mm -hmm. So those are simple things. There's several other things, but stickering like that is just another one where we spend a ton of time yeah. doing it. It pencils out to do it by hand, but you don't necessarily have to do it by hand at 6 a.m. on July 8th. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So, um, so that would be another, so that, so I would, so we got here because I was talking about the hard times. I think when we're really busy and people are exhausted is a hard time. And then for me as an operator, the lean times from a financial standpoint, those are some really hard times. Mm -hmm. uh, if I don't have payroll set aside through the end of January, by the end of September, I'm not going to be able to do it. Mm. We don't have enough sales in October, November, December to cover additional costs. So we really need to stockpile in July, August, September to get through the next four to five months. And then we use line of credit to get to plant sale. You know, we have a hundred thousand dollar line of credit and we use that to get to a plant sale. And then we try to pay that off by the end of June. And then in July, we're back doing like, we're stockpiling on our acorns for July, August, September. And then we're, we're plateauing. So our trimesters are, a, a busy time when everybody has to work more hours and our labor to sales is really, really strong. And then a time when the overall operation is probably break even. So from like the beginning of October to Christmas, yep. if we were a farm that way year round, that would probably be like our cruising altitude. And then the other trimester is January till April. And that's when our costs are quite a bit higher. It's an, it's, it's an important time to, yeah. to do. So we're going to change up the scheduling next year. So everybody will still be able to work full time. But if you want to get 30 hours in the winter trimester, you need to work 50 hours in the summer trimester. Gotcha. Yeah. An idea I got from our accountant who does that with a uh, contractually with her other accounts who work for her that tax season, you must work 60 hours. If in the summer you want to get 40. Gotcha. Very and as a farm, we're exempt from all yeah. overtime rules. So it's not, there's not a lot of risk. There's not any extra cost. Yeah. yeah. So are you running um, accrual or cash for your accounting? I don't know. Okay. Probably cash then. They'll I don't probably worry about it. Yeah. We outsource all that to an accountant. I, I make <laughs> invoices, but uh, all we, you know, focus on your strengths. Our accountant does all that. This prompted another thought I wanted to mention because the other, there's another, there's another pain point that I forgot oh. to mention. Weekends. Mm -hmm. Yep. The plants don't know it's Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're not milking cows, Brian. <laughs> everyone who works here knows it's Saturday and Sunday. And everyone who works here who has a spouse or a partner mm -hmm. who has, a, they may or may not have a job. Some of them are service sector too, but they may also know that it's Saturday or Sunday, or, or it may be the opposite. You know, somebody might have a spouse who's in the in retail or restaurants, and, and they're quite busy on the weekends. So um, we're in the middle of a grand experiment okay. where Ann and I had this idea, because the weekends are a huge pain point for Ann and Brian, because yeah. we live here, nobody else works on the weekends here. They're Monday through Friday. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, wow. Yeah. How do you think I get to the 72 hours, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> so we've done some things to make it easier. We automated our roll-up sides. We've get getting our irrigation under control and doing some ventilation, things like that. But what we've decided, and we will find out the results in the next week or two to implement for next year, but with the parameters that I gave you earlier of 50, 45 to 55 hours in the summer, 25 to 35 in the winter, 40 in the, in the um, yeah. fall, we are letting everybody craft their dream schedule for their life as they can best anticipate for 2020. And then they're all going to bring in their dream schedules next week. And Ann and I are going to map it out and see if there's anything that fits. If somebody's spouse works as a, as a cook or a server and they never see them because they work nights, well, then maybe you don't come here at six in the morning, which nobody does right now, right? But maybe, yeah. maybe you come at 10 and you work till seven. That mm -hmm. way you guys get the morning together. Or maybe you work on Saturday or Sunday because your partner's already working on Saturday or Sunday. Mm -hmm. Or um, somebody else's daycare obligations and they'd rather work four twelves than five tens, mm -hmm. right? Because then they have one less day of daycare and they're still logging enough hours, mm -hmm. you know? And so... We're going to start to try to think of this in like an opener and a closer, which is like how any other business that spans more than an eight hour workday does it. Yeah. So I love mornings and Corey loves mornings. You know, we'll probably be the openers and we're both happy to start at six, though nobody else does. Mm -hmm. But like maybe we start at six and somebody else goes till seven, but then we're, we're done and gone. And yeah. so uh, we're going to see how that shakes out. 
but that's one of our visions for next year because the farm runs seven days a week. It's just that Ann and I have been absorbing that for six years now. And we would like, as we've got, you know, a one and a half year old, we would like to start uh, recapturing a little bit, of, at least of Sunday, right? I mean, Saturday we have farmer's market and it's basically a full work day, but yeah. at least one of Sunday. So that's, that's a grand experiment we're in. And um, it's something that I think we're going to all try to work through and honor each other's desires. Yeah. And within that, we're also implementing a paid time off program. So okay. the other pain point was people took a lot of vacation in the summer, which is hard. Yeah. So we're going to incentivize paid time off in the winter trimester up to, I think, eight days paid. But in the summer, you can take off up to like seven days, but only one of them is going to be paid. Gotcha. Okay. Right? Like we, we want you to be able to take time off. And if somebody worked the fewest number of hours to stay full time with us and took their paid time off, they'd be able to take seven weeks off a year. But only one and a half of those weeks could possibly fall mm -hmm. this time. So like, you want to take a month off in, in the winter? Fine. We'll buy your plane tickets. They've all got a standing offer. We'll buy their plane tickets, send them anywhere they want to go in the United States. We'll pay your plane tickets to go wherever you want. But in the summer, we're really going to need you here because mm -hmm. that's, that's when the farm needs you the most. Wow. That's an incredibly thought out way of looking at it. And we'll find out in a couple of weeks if it works. <laughs> <laughs> But remember, in paying these people and in having invested parties, I'm improving my quality of life. And like when I see farmers that are burnt out, it's because everything's falling on them. Mm -hmm. It's not because the labor of picking the tomato is too much. It's because doing it for 15, 16 hours a day, seven days a week is too much. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some people think I should make more money than my other workers. And I'm like, look, money doesn't bring me happiness, but like, a lazy Sunday morning will. Mm -hmm. and so what's the value of that? Quite a bit. And it just might turn out that the value to one of our workers having Wednesday off so they can share it with their spouse who works in the service sector doesn't really care about working on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And what a great value exchange where we both felt like we won mm -hmm. and actually the farm is better off as a result. Mm -hmm. Man, yeah, absolutely. Is there also an ice cream machine going to end up there too? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we did build a break room and then we did have access to a free air hockey table. But as it turns out, this is not Silicon Valley and our break room is not big enough for a dining table and an air hockey table. So that's currently in the barn. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so no, no, no ice cream machine, but because we do have young kids and everybody else does have young kids, we do um, share our nanny with that with them. Oh, they very cool. Yeah, so so some of them bring their kids to work, and then we just split the nanny cost fifty fifty, and then that way they can they can nurse, and their kids are here and take breaks whenever they need to to do that. It, again, that just goes to back to like being a human. If we didn't have yeah. a kid, I'm not hiring a nanny to come in just because some of our workers have a kid, but we do, and we yeah. did. So like, why not make make the yeah. most? Yeah, 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 that's that's definitely something that we want to again just make sure because again, stable daycare makes for stable workers, right? So like, it's not like it's not like we're just like a charity here. Yeah, like, like, the farm gets a lot of value out of having a core core team members here reliably seven days a week, five days a week, whatever the case may be. Yeah, and the most common reason for somebody not being able to come into work is childcare. At least for us, I, that's probably true a lot of places, but at least for us, where there's like four or five kids among us and the oldest one is three, you know, the most common reason for somebody not coming in is because their childcare fell through or their kids are sick or whatever. Mm -hmm. So if there's any way for us to be able to accommodate that, then, you know, I'd be a fool not, not to try to help. So let's wrap this all up a little bit here because sure. one of the things I'm seeing you guys do, well, I've watched you guys for a long time. I think yep. the first time I met you was um, I invited you to the frozen ground with yep. Sandy. That was frozen ground one that you came to. And it was very interesting to see because you brought your numbers. That was the key way you got to come. Yep. But how you have built your farm intentionally has built out, you've built out a certain uh, a scale of cropping systems that works for you that you know you make good margin on. But what that's also allowed you to do is free yourself up around those cropping systems to think about your business strategically, to actually grow that business and add these little pieces in, which is just making the entire business so, so, so much better. Look, 
the only thing I like more than a competitive advantage is leveraging that competitive advantage. My firm belief is as long as these four individuals are working full time for us, I want to just keep becoming stronger, better, bigger, faster, as long as they're here. If, if one of them has to move on, that's fine. Hopefully we're paying them so much money that we can instantly split it up into two jobs to replace them. So I don't really need to worry about finding that one golden person to replace them. I could easily throw two people at it by the time they leave. Yeah. But, but if somebody's here for four years, they're making $20 an hour by the time they're here for four years. And, and that's, that's because we want them to stay here and we want to keep leveraging that. And like we watch some of our fellow farmers have 100% turnover every year. Mm -hmm. I, Michael, that, I, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that's not sustainable. Well, it's not sustainable there. It's also embittering so many people to the small or scale organic movement. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's destroying our credibility. I've had people say, you know, people make these YouTube videos and put them out. And like Curtis Stone made one that had us in it. And somebody was just like, wow, 10% profit margin only made $41,000 a year. That doesn't seem worth it. And I'm like, I mean, to each their own, but like show me another third party accountants numbers of another farm with 10% profit margin after everyone made $20 an hour, like my draw doesn't come out of the profit margin. I'm in the salaries and expenses category. Yeah. So that's just on top of it. Show me another farm, you know, and like for every example, the one consistent pattern is people trying to poke holes in us. Yeah. I, well, have, no book, I have no book to sell. I yeah. have no workshop to sell. I'm not, I'm not doing any of these other things. In fact, I would argue just the opposite. I take all the energy that might go into that and just pour it right back into our business, into our team, and then we're better off as a result of it. Mm -hmm. But like, but like, I'm sorry, like, yeah, not, no, you could not achieve this style of farming, this sort of business quality of life, I think, if you only grew potatoes. Mm -hmm. But like, it's not my job to help you figure out how to grow only potatoes. Like, maybe that's not your ticket. Mm -hmm. There are tons of crops I love that we do not grow. Mm -hmm. Because I love having this job and these people in my life. I can go buy that from any of the other farmers who are happy to do it, right? Yes. But, but like we need to focus on what we're good at so that our team can have a vibrant way of life and we can keep getting better at it. And like mm -hmm. that to me, like if this all blows up tomorrow, like I don't have any regrets. Mm -hmm. We took care of them. We paid them well. We took them out to lunch after the hard tasks. We yeah. paid them to go on vacation. I mean, whatever, whatever the thing was. They needed to buy a car. We gave them some money. We gave them their bonus early. Like, what, whatever it is, I just feel like we treated them how we want to be treated. And like that, I don't know if there's anything more you can really do than just treat people the way you want to be treated. I, I don't think there's any secrets to that. Yeah. Well, it comes back to the most basic human rule, the golden rule. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, you know, the people – whether they realize it or not, a lot of farmers are making a lot of would-be farmers want nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. There's this OK Boomer thing going around right now. And this will, like, forever date this, this video. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> I was at a strategic planning conference with a conscious capitalism advisor for our local chamber of commerce last week. And somebody said people don't quit jobs they quit bosses uh -huh. i 100 percent agree with that i had never heard that but i understood it intimately both where i stayed and where i had quit before yeah and i said to these to my peers in the room though most of them are towards the boomer end of the spectrum and i said with unlimited resources i think our business would be like a humane society for millennials who have been mistreated by boomer bosses, <laughs> right? Because just the rhetoric used, the way they talk about it, it's, it's unrealistic. Yeah. It's unrealistic. And so um, I, I want, we just try to be so realistic with people and like our Christmas gift to our workers this year, in addition to bonuses, in addition to throwing a holiday party, in addition to all the other good things that are fun and good is we're, we're giving them all individual meetings with a uh, personal financial advisor 
to work on their financial literacy and household budgeting and individual meetings with um, an independent insurance broker to review their insurance portfolio, make sure they have what they want with no sales agenda. This is not like some Edward Jones pyramid scheme. Like yeah. these people yeah. can have no sales agenda. We trust them to meet with our workers and help them just make sure every part of their life is being taken care of. Because again, if that's mm -hmm. taken care of, then we can all just focus on being our jolly band of vegetable growers and not worrying about all the other things. Wow. That is so cool. Yeah. Um, I heard Simon Sinek speak on the exact same thing that you're talking about there. I heard him from stage talk about it. How if you look at the old GE way, so you know the Jack Welch way of I always fire the bottom 10% because I'm always going to try to get better people. Yep. And that is how you destroy a company morale is just everyone's afraid they're going to the bottom 10% and going to be axed. And you're saying, I'm going to provide daycare if I can help it do it as part of the goals of moving the company forward. And, like, and again, not for free. Here, like with the daycare, we pay them, let's say $12.50, $15 an hour. Then if we we're splitting it three ways, everybody pays $5. If we split it two ways, everybody pays $7.50. It's, it's just that the service is here and it's less than you can get elsewhere because we live in an area where all the daycares have waiting lists. So it's as almost as much just a value add that it exists Mm -hmm. It's not even like the Silicon Valley, like we're not paying people to move here. We're not giving them free daycare. We're just trying to, we're just trying to help where mm -hmm. we can. All right. Any final thoughts, Brian? I know that was a little bit of a rant there, but. No, I don't like to think of it as a rant. Like, <laughs> it as a, something worth aspiring to. My only plea is that other growers compete on the field, right? Like I, I use a lot of sports analogies. We got a lot of sports people on our team. Like, Compete on the field. When you go to farmer's markets, compete there. But when it comes to treating your workers well and trying to find a way to improve your business, spend a little less time poking holes in, in what may not be real or, you know, accurate. And just trust that, like, some of us don't have a hidden agenda. Mm -hmm. Some of us are not trying to sell anything. Like, we're trying to sell vegetables and we're just trying to run a business that we're proud of. And could I make more money if I paid these people less? For sure. But it would be short-lived and my quality of life would suffer. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. That, 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 I just think you, you, need to, you need to know thyself and know what you need to achieve. But I, I want to raise kids on this farm that don't resent this farm. Mm -hmm. I want to have a life on this farm that doesn't make me resent this farm. And I just want to never forget that, like, we run the farm. The farm does not run us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think and it's, it's easier to say in the winter than it is to say in the summer. Don't get me wrong. But, like, try yeah. to put those fail safes in place so that you don't, it, it just doesn't happen that way. Yeah. I think you're also saying, too, is you want to live a life of no regrets. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are days where I dream of just having an office job because, yeah. like, don't it, would off. So, it would be so easy. But as long as those days are vastly outnumbered by the days when I think I've got the best job in the world, that's yeah. all right. <laughs> that's all right. It's not yeah. all perfect heirloom tomatoes and rainbows over here. Like there are, there are days where yes. I'm like, this is insane. But, yeah. but just recognizing that that is most often a moment in time and, and knowing that overall you're, you're on the straight and narrow. Mm. Very good. Well, Brian, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. As always, I always get so much out of these conversations. It makes me start thinking about, okay, how can I make life better for our employees? So, because yeah. um, we have a team now in our company. It's amazing just in the last year how our team has grown um, just uh, as we keep supporting farmers. So, again, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. I know you're very busy. And uh, have a happy Thanksgiving tomorrow. Right. You too. Thanks for having me. Talk to you later. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.